Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus and today we enter retro sci-fi cinema with Brian J. Walker. Greetings and welcome, Brian. Uh, good evening, Hercules. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. How are you doing? I'm well tonight. Fantastic. I saw your note and I'm really looking forward to what you have prepared for us today. So onwards. Well, you know, when I was thinking about uh, possible topics, of course, you know, it, it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's uh, October. Halloween yes. is upon us. Tomorrow night, I am taking a group of 30 college students to Pittsburgh's amusement park, uh, Kennywood, for what they call awesome. Phantom, what they call Phantom Fright Nights. And there are uh, uh, people, Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre is in the park chasing you, you know, with, with a running chainsaw <laughs> with, with no chain. Um, it, it's fun, but it's not that much fun. Um, and there are a, a series of uh, like mazes that are ha sort of haunted mazes uh, mm -hmm. that are a lot of fun. They have all of their roller coasters up and running. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a bl it's a blast. It, it reminds me of what I'm missing by being young. So. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gone to one of those in uh, quite a while. I used to like uh, going to those uh, um, Halloween type of experiences. And, and my wife in uh, her younger days, uh, she used to act in them. So she's been all sorts of monsters and victim of monsters and ghosts and, and so forth. And uh, she shares her tales and it sounds like uh, tons of fun being on the other side and also dealing with the invariable crises that never stop. Uh, and so having to, to kind of wing it as you're going along. Well, we have uh, something uh, very close to us in, in Smithfield, Pennsylvania, which is about a 20, 25 minute drive called Rich's Fright Farm. Um, during the spring and summer, it is an unassuming greenhouse where and they, they do things in bulk. So it's a pretty large operation. Uh, and in the fall, the old farmhouse that still sits on the property, it turns into this you know, sort of nightmare mansion kind of thing where in each room that you walk through in the old house, it, it has a different theme. I, uh, the, the last year, I, I went in 2019, that was the last year I got to go. Uh, there was a saw room, for example. Uh, um, there was a zombie room. There was, yeah, I mean, there were you know, different things. Uh, so much fun, and uh, I, I would. It looks to me like working one of those would actually be very difficult. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what your wife's experience was in it, but uh, it, it looks—it's a lot. You know, you're standing out there in the cold. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you have to be made up. Um, that, that's hard on your skin. You have to spit uh, blood and. Uh... And I got to tell you, I mean, in order to be menacing, it takes a lot of energy. You know, you, you have to be up for it. Uh -huh. you, can't, you can't just be passive and say, you know, boo, you know, something like that. I mean, you, you really have to go for it. You have to really love it. Now, you've shared that you created these type of environments uh, in your home. I have, yes. So um, did you jump out and scare people also? Uh, did you bleed or... Actually, um, by the time our, our uh, Halloween party would roll around, at, it, we, we'd probably spent a week on the haunted house, which is my garage. Um, I was probably too exhausted to do anything uh, other uh -huh. than coerce some of my friends to work the haunted house. One of my uh, friends is 6'8". I mean, he's a really big guy. And he had on you know, a, a black cape uh, and he pulled it down over his head, and we had him crouched down right before the end of the, the haunted garage. And he would stand up, he, he would be crouched down like this, and then he would stand up and make himself even bigger. It scared everybody who came through. Wow. Was, it uh, <laughs> well, and it didn't cost a penny, which was, you know, I didn't have to buy a $300 prop, like, unfortunately, like I have. Uh, from time to time. Don't get the holes through the, uh, um, you cut the holes in the walls so that you could reach through. Oh, that's that. true. I for, I'd forgotten about that. Uh, we would wall the whole thing off. So uh -huh. it would seem bigger than just a two car garage. Um, and we would cut holes so those of us who were working the haunted house could reach out and, you know, grab somebody or, or, or grab it, not really grab them, uh, but grab at them. I guess that would be a better way to put it. 
And sometimes it was to make a prop actually work that it kind of crapped out in the middle of the night. So it sounds like fun. Once you retire, will you be continuing this uh, tradition or growing it or? I think, yeah, that's a good question. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, this is the second year of, you know, no Halloween party, uh, no haunted house. And it's, a, it's such a shame because uh, I got to tell you, I'm not patting myself on the back, but over the years, I've collected some really cool Halloween stuff. I can imagine. <laughs> and it's a shame not to show it off, right? <laughs> My, my wife put a werewolf skeleton and an owl and some pumpkins in our front yard. Uh, we haven't been getting a lot of trick-or-treaters, especially in the past uh, year, uh, because again, the pandemic, but we have candy and uh, my uh, youngest son, he dresses up in a creepy costume. So if trick-or-treaters come to the door, they get a shock uh, when he opens the door. We made the mistake last year of leaving the candy outside and the first couple of trick-or-treaters absconded <laughs> with all the candy, so. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I've worked a lot of dog and pony shows in my day where we have giveaways. I've, uh, I've, done, I've done it practically my whole career, which is kind of odd since I didn't work in higher ed, but, but still, you'd be surprised how many uh, giveaways there are in higher ed. Um, anyway, um, I, I kind of lost track of what I was, where I was going to go with that one. But uh, <laughs> you, well, I guess the moral of the story is you never you never display all of your wares on your table at once. I guess that's the, probably yes. the best thing. because you're right. The first few people will wipe you out. And we learn not to have too much Halloween stuff because then we're stuck with it and nobody's diet. Uh, it's really not a friendly thing on anybody's diet. So, I know, but that's, that's kind of a slippery slope. And you, uh, unfortunately, we don't have trick or treaters out here. We live. Um, we live in a development, but the lots are pretty roomy. Uh -huh. And there's not enough houses out here to make it worthwhile for, I mean, there's probably only like 20 houses or so. Um, and in, in, a little closer into town, there are you know, massive um, housing complexes that will give you like two or 300 you know, possibilities. And it seems to, a lot of kids go into those neighborhoods where the houses are pretty close. And ours, like I said, are spaced apart and we don't really have that many. And we haven't had a trick-or-treater in 20 years. And oh. the best trick-or-treater we had was taller than I am. <laughs> I'm serious. I had to look, I had to crane my neck and I was like, whoa, kid, I'm six <laughs> feet tall. So, you know, <laughs> you're a big one. But he, but he was <laughs> polite. Any trunk or treats? That's what they do here in our community. They have like a lot and everybody parks around and they go from car to car from car to trunk, car to trunk uh, getting goodies. Um, doing that somewhere around here, you? We, well, you know, I've actually participated in a couple of trunk and treats and, and those are okay. Um, I, I don't have a problem with that. They're portable, that's nice. So you can do them in you know, uh, a rec field or a parking lot, you know, or something like that. And I, I, it, it's very expedient. You know, you can pick up a lot of candy in 10, 15 minutes. Um, I, 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 I guess I miss the way it was. Uh, you know, when you, you went out for hours, you know, and as long as that front porch light was on, you could bang on the door. Right. So, and and I, I also miss some of the homemade stuff that you used to get. When I was a kid, um, we lived in a neighborhood which was primarily retiree. And my, my parents were like one of the few young couples, you know, around, one with kids. So when you trick-or-treated in my neighborhood, you got things like homemade brownies, uh, caramel apples. Oh, wow. Uh, Popcorn balls, things like that, and, and you know, it's tall. <laughs> you know, yeah, no, I need that now. <laughs> um, but you Sorry. got you got homemade things, and you knew the people, so you, you didn't worry, you know, about a razor blade and an apple or, you know, or uh -huh. something. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, I'm not sure that that ever really happened. I think those reports are apocryphal. They, they uh, were urban, urban legends. Yeah, everybody knew somebody who knew somebody who, you know, uh, it happened uh, to, and they're all the news reports. And uh, that was the beginning of the end for uh, the Halloween we knew when we were younger. Well, and I, I think, you know, today uh, it, giving out apples would be really safe because none of the kids would eat them, even if they were <laughs> you know, with razor blades or poison or anything like that. What's so. this red thing? <laughs> Oh. 
Oh, anyway. we'll have to invent new Halloween uh, traditions then. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of have really you know, over the years. Uh, I was really saddened with the, the death of uh, Trick or Treat. Uh, I just, it's just not the same as it used to be. And I can't even no. participate in it now because I live out in the sticks. Um, so I, I did have built my own tradition. I, we've been having, well, except for the last two years now, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, we've had a Halloween party for probably 20 years. I'm starting that tradition uh, next year. I announced it uh, several times uh, at family uh, get-togethers. Uh, we're not really holiday people. We don't really celebrate, you know, the holidays or, or events uh, regularly. But our anniversary is on Halloween, and Halloween is our favorite holiday. And nobody else does anything on Halloween. So we figure rather than competing with Thanksgiving and Christmas, where the house people come to when they have nowhere else to go during those holidays. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll cook meals on that day for whoever might drop by. But uh, um, Halloween, that is our holiday. So we're going to make it our holiday. So we're going to come up with uh, new traditions. And uh, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to doing that starting when the pandemic is over. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I, I have a very small family. I'm an only child. Uh, and my partner, uh, he's, uh, he, he's, he has his brother and that's, that's really, you know, his only living relative. So um, we get, we tend to get together with friends over the holidays mm -hmm. more than anything else. And that's one of the reasons why we host the Halloween party. Uh, the Halloween party you know, for us is, you know, it's harvest time as well. It's a great time to gather, you know, yes. and, and imbibe and, and whatnot, um, and just have a good time and enjoy all the great horror horror films that I've watched. I probably watched 50 horror films in the last 20 days. We, we've talked about this. Yeah, we have that tradition too. Uh, we're watching now a TV series, Hemlock Grove, which has an original take on uh, vampires, werewolves, dragons, mm -hmm. you know, and, and things like that. Uh, but uh, we, we've talked before about those favorite uh, holiday uh, um, Halloween films. Uh, and so as, as uh, Christmas time or Yule time approaches, we're going to start watching those uh, again. Well, and I, like I said, I've been watching uh, a lot of them. And uh, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about tonight were some of the films that, you know, they, they may not be the all time best for. I, I don't want to get into you know, any kind of a pissing match over you know, which horror film is better. Uh -huh. But I do want to talk about some horror films that I think are really required viewing, especially for you know, younger horror fans. Um, a lot of you know, the millennials and Gen X uh, uh, horror fans are actually, uh, they actually get pretty pumped up about you know, the OG. They want to go back and see um, you know, some earlier films, or they might want to see the original film uh, that the sequel that they liked so much was based on. And they, they seem to be uh, more inquisitive. Uh, and I think that's uh, horror and sci-fi are great ways to pull like new uh, young people, I should say, not new, but young people uh, into the genre. It's an easy way to do it. And there are so many great films out there in the past, yes. ones, ones that really created subgenre you know, within horror. Uh, if you think about it, there are all different kinds of subgenre in horror. Um, and I mean, they're kind of easily categorized. I mean, there's zombie movies. Um, that, that's sort of a, a huge, you know, uh, subgenre of horror film. And, and you know, there, there, we've had zombie movies, you know, for the past 60 or 70 years now, and, and a plethora of them at that. Then you've yes. got sort of the classic universal monsters, uh, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman. Um, but there are other permutations of horror as well. There's a lot of psychological horror, which you didn't really see, you know, a whole lot in, in the 30s, but you started seeing in the 60s. And there are just so many of these films that started, that started genre, yeah, started subgenre, I guess I should say, that I really wanted to talk about tonight. Sure, I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Okay, and, and none of these uh, films are really out of left field either. Um, they're ones that I, I'm sure you've probably seen uh, for the most part. Uh, and the first one I was thinking about was Invasion of the Body Snatchers. 
Awesome. Uh, the original version, the, the, the 1956 version, uh, which, you know, as we've come to know, uh, can be read as a political allegory, one which might still hold true. Uh, but um, it really is a terrifying movie on its own. And the, there's no blood or anything. Do you know what I mean? Right. Uh, there's no traditional like stock standard ways that you know one would normally try to frighten an audience in the 1950s there's no uh you know axe wielding maniac there, there's no you know terrifying you know uh, <laughs> creature of science um it was all psychological and and just in people's manners and such um well, there's, yeah. there's things more frightening than uh what if the people you know aren't the people you know and what if you're not the person you know, so th that is a frightening concept to contemplate and to watch it play out, wh whatever version you, you, you saw of the body snatchers, th th that is something that could really uh, disturb somebody. Well, and it's a really complex film, too. You know, Kevin McCarthy, uh, I think that you, I can't imagine anybody else doing the part, uh, at least in the 56 version. I know Donald, uh, Donald Sutherland, I almost said Donald Pleasance. Uh, that would have been an interesting movie. Uh, but Donald Sutherland did the 1978 uh, mm -hmm. uh, version, which I remember seeing in the, uh, actually, I think I saw it at the drive-in when I was a kid. It's you a very, very good movie. But in the original one, I can't imagine anybody else portraying the character the way Kevin McCarthy did. And it's interesting in that, you know, he's, he's clearly sane and, knows that something's not right, but he acts completely insane. <laughs> uh, well, and I like that juxtaposition where, you, well, is he crazy? You, you know, um, I, I, his uh, performance is really multi-layered and uh, it, it's a great performance. And I love Donna Winter. Um, I, I don't, I, you, she didn't make enough movies if, if you ask me and she sort of provides sort of a uh, she's sort of the antithesis of him she's a much cooler presence um and it's it's interesting to see you know the two characters weighed against each other i mean she's <laughs> she, she makes him a little more tolerable uh, i guess that i guess i should say but but what a fantastic movie and you know i mean that same trope has been used in, in countless horror films but you and, and you know how I feel about remakes. I, I usually lean to, lean to the original, and in this case, um, you know, the, the performances are just brilliant. Um, the, the two lead characters are, are amazing. Yeah, that I can I definitely recommend that one uh, to be on everybody's list uh, for this time of year. Well, fortunately, about twenty or so years ago, I was able to um, get a, a signed. It's an it's an eight by ten uh, promo from a promotional shot from um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Uh, I know it's eleven by fourteen. I'm sorry. Uh, and Donna Winter and Kevin McCarthy signed it, and it's got a certificate of authenticity. And share it, awesome. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, it's actually not uh, hanging up right now. Uh, it, it's uh, in a closet only because our Halloween stuff is out. And believe it or not, I had to pull you know, a picture from a horror film to put up Halloween stuff. That's kind of sad. Isn't it? Awesome. Um, but uh, you, the, you know, the first time I saw that movie, and I, you know, I, now that I think about it, I think I, I might have been an adult. I, I might have seen it on you know, TBS or something like that. But the first time I, I watched it, I remembered being, you know, being chilled by it. I mean, it, I, I was, you know, terrified by it. It's very scared. And, you know, when, when a horror film can push your buttons, and I'm so cynical now that, you know, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to get a rise out of me. Um, but when a film can, you know, push my buttons and it can get me going and draw me into it and give me a few chills, that means it's a good horror film. Mm -hmm. And now even video games look cinematic. Uh, the the video game, like I remember when Pong came out, that was the epitome of uh, uh, technology. And now, you, I don't know, sometimes when I watch uh, shots from video games, I, I don't have time to play video games anymore, uh, but uh, I can't tell if I'm looking at a movie or if I'm looking at uh, shots from a game, everything is, the, the production values are, are excellent. They are. Um... 
uh, some of my students uh, have a lounge, uh, which is the floor below where my office is. And we've got two 50-inch uh, TVs mounted uh, on either end of the wall. And uh, they're hooked up to two different PlayStations. So, oh, no, I'm sorry. Two different uh, gaming platforms. One is a PlayStation, but the other's not. Um, and I, I walk in there and I'm thinking, you know, gosh, you know, this looks fantastic. <laughs> I, oh, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not into gaming, uh, but but so many of our students are. Um, and th that's a good way to draw people into different genres as well as gaming. And it, now they have virtual gaming, too, where you could actually be there. Um, um, I have one virtual game. I've never played it. I don't have the virtual equipment, but it was Theseus and the Minotaur. So how can I not uh, have that? But uh, um, uh, th th you're totally immersed. Uh, my youngest uh, son, again, he gave me his set one day and you're totally surrounded by the environment and you look around and you could move around. Uh, so uh, uh, the only thing is if you're using your hands, your hands are like these disembodied hands that are floating in space, uh, which can be quite disorienting. Uh, but they have horror, you could be in the middle of a horror movie, in the middle of a sci-fi movie, a murder mystery. Uh, so again, I wish I was younger so I, I can get into all this more. Yeah, well, I mean, there's nothing, to, there's nothing about age that holds you back from gaming. Um, and if it's, it's just something I've never done, I, I, I certainly don't hate it. Or um, I guess I just haven't found my interest in it yet. But it does look interesting, I will say yeah. that. Um, another film that I think is one that does get overlooked a lot. I, I don't think enough people know about it, especially uh, you know, fans, uh, you know, good quality horror films. And you know, psychological horror is hard to get away with. I mean, it's, it's hard to do. But when it's done well, it's so effective. And the movie I'm thinking about is a French film uh, titled Eyes Without a Face. Um, I, I uh, w was lucky enough to get a copy of it uh, a number of years ago on DVD. And I'd always read, it was one of those films I'd always read about. And there, there was just no way for me to, to see it. And when it finally came out, finally came out on DVD, I, I couldn't wait to get it. And when I watched it, you know, sometimes when you get a big buildup for a film that, that you've read about, and you actually see it, you're thinking, eh, you know, <laughs> it's left something to be desired. That is not the case with this movie. Actually, I think it's even better than uh, the accolades that it's received. Uh, it, it has a, a female, well, it, it, you get into a gray area with, with when you have a, you a female monster, and I know that uh, female monsters in 50s and 60s films has launched probably a million dissertations uh, uh -huh. by, by this point, but I think there, there really is something to look at uh, in it, and the, the antagonist is female, but she's sympathetic at the same time. You, you sort of buy into her plight. Um, as if you know, this wasn't really her fault, but it's turned her into this. Mm -hmm. And it's just such an incredible movie to watch. Um, and uh, you don't even need, well, I mean, I, I, whenever I have watched the film, I have watched it with subtitles, but to tell you the truth, after the first or second viewing, you don't really need the subtitles because you understand right. what's going on. It, it is beautifully made. Um, I, I talk about Italian films uh, a lot, especially when it comes to horror. Um, but you know, uh, the French make some of the best ones. And a little later this evening, I'm going to talk about a public domain uh, horror film that was made in France that is one of one of my favorites. Uh, but I'm going to set the public domain stuff aside. Okay. Um, now, something that uh, you didn't really have a name, but I always enjoyed was seeing. Um, you uh, people who had been A-list actors at one point appearing in lower budget horror films. I right. mean, you saw a lot of that in the 50s and 60s. And oftentimes it's titled hag horror, which, which is, it was so, which is a very disappointing title. Um, but unfortunately that, that title has stuck. Um, and it's characterized by uh, mo great movies, uh, such as Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, you know, where you've got, you know, for the price of one ticket, you've got two, you know, uh, former A-listers uh, 
Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. Um, now that's the one that everybody knows, but there are some other ones uh, in, in that same subgenre of, of you know, hag horror. And some, and there were some actors who also made hag horror films, so that wasn't just the exclusive domain of actresses. Um, but the, whatever happened to Baby Jane it almost has to be the best um, because it's so superbly acted. It actually had a budget behind it, too. I mean, not a massive budget, but it was over a million dollars. And in the early 60s, you could make you know, a quality film, which they Quite did. Film, yeah. yeah. Um, but as you know, with horror films, usually you have a fraction of a million dollars and a, and a tiny one at that. Um, and oftentimes, uh, some of the other um, films of this subgenre are, are cheaper, but there's some great ones. Uh, one that I saw as a kid and loved, it was called Lady in a Cage. Uh, <clears throat> it came out in 1964, and Olivia de Havilland um, is, well, I don't really want to give the plot away, but, but she's the uh, star of the film. And uh, it, it's a lot of fun, and it's more of a psychological thriller as well. I mean, it, but it does have some horror overtones. Uh, Straight Jacket with Joan Crawford. Uh, if, if Baby Jane's my favorite hag horror film, uh, Straight Jacket's probably my second favorite. Uh, it's a William Castle film, and Wh William Castle's one of my favorite horror directors. Uh, he, he, his films were cheesy, but they were slick at the same time. Uh, they were they were competently made. There were no jump cuts or you know cheap sets or anything like that. I mean, he turned out a quality product, but he would do anything to promote them. And I think that often, for some people, it might have cheapened them. But for me, it, it, it's it's heartwarming, you know, <laughs> that, that that he promoted them uh, as um, uh, enthusiastically as he did. And he, he uh, Castle would often at times have gimmicks in the theaters. He might uh, wire a few seats or might have a few seats in the theater wired to uh, you know, buzz somebody, you know, to, to <laughs> degree, things like that. What, he wasn't doing that by the time he made uh, Straight Jacket, but he found, I hate to say it, but he found his gimmick in Joan Crawford. And he did you know, sort of... Uh, put her in two different time periods, actually kind of successfully because he has her as a, a woman who's about 60 years old and she would have been about that age when she made the film. But he also has her as a woman at about 35. And I, I gotta tell you, she convincingly portrays both. That would be uh, impossible for me to do. I, I could not uh, convincingly play myself for 25 years ago now. <laughs> I, just, I just couldn't do it. And she does a pretty good job, and she carries the weight of the film uh, on her shoulders and seems happy to do so. And it's just so much fun. I mean, you know, Joan Crawford's an axe murderess. I mean, it's, it's just perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, now there's a twist in it, though, So, it, which I don't want to give away for people who, for somebody who might not have seen the movie. Um, but, but it's so much fun. It has some great character actors. Rochelle Hudson. Leif Erickson's in it. Diane Baker, uh, she's done probably 200 roles, you know, over the course wow. of her career. Uh, she's in Silence of the Lambs. Uh, she, so you, she has some horror tie-ins too. Um, and it's, a, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, another one, the, one of the uh, film, one of the movies of the day that I ran just a few days ago, it's another William Castle film. Uh, titled The Night Walker, and Barbara Stanwyck is the uh, uh, older actress that you need to watch out for uh, because uh, she's quite an interesting character. I, it's, a, it's a really fun movie, too. Uh, kind of an interesting tidbit about that film is that her co-star in it is Robert Taylor, and she and Robert Taylor were once married, but they were divorced long before they starred in this film. But they started. Well, I think that's fantastic that you can, you know, um, end a relationship like that, but still be willing to work with one another. So that, and, and you know, William Castle there again did use gimmicks, and I think that was, I hate to put it that way, but probably a gimmick. You you see, see the battling divorcees you know, in my in my horror film. 
um, did they have any love scenes together or because that's a gimmick that's used a lot. Uh, it, it is, but uh, you know, gosh, you just have to watch the film. I, okay. I, I don't, don't want to get. I've, any... I've seen these films years ago because they. I'm getting echoes in my mind. I just haven't seen them uh, in maybe decades. Well, um, you, you know, I, I, I'm like you. Um, you know, there are certain films that I, I watch again and again and again, mm -hmm. and there are some films which I love that I've only seen maybe a time or two. I don't know why. I used to be able, used to, be able to recite uh, every line in Conan and Beneath the Planet of the Apes. <laughs> I have a list of things that I knew every single line. And uh, I used I used to work for um, a different state agency uh, before I began working at the university where I work now. And my supervisor, my boss at the time, could recite practically every line from Planet of the Apes. Hmm. And there was always some, we, we had an, an unusual office that was run badly. So there was always a, <laughs> there was always a famous, you know, film line that you could apply to how absurd, you know, the administration uh, of my organization was. Well, myths are our collective unconscious uh, projected outwards. They're our mythology. So it, it's very apt, you know, uh, uh, and even people have become, uh, uh, fanatical about uh, movies the same way in antiquity they performed rituals you know around the myths that were being told by uh, storytellers uh, uh, song masters and playwrights well it had also allowed us the leverage of having an inside joke that we could just we could talk about openly and you had to be in the know to get it so if you didn't it, you you wouldn't really care so, it's, so the, it's sort of you know, being in with the in crowd, I guess, but, but, it, you know, but it requires intellect. So, and, and a healthy dose of cinema watching over the years. So uh, th that's a very impressive uh, progression of movies. Um, what's there, next? Well, there, there are a lot more uh, to, to hag horror. A couple of my favorites, uh, Picture Mommy Dead, uh, the 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 these the films. Titles are, great. Oh yeah, uh, and there's nothing that'll draw you in faster to a horror film than a great title. The title. So Picture of the Dead's an awesome title. It's actually done by Bert I. Gordon. You know the the giant really? bug. Um, uh, the, you know, the giant bug director, um, and uh, he does a really good job with it. And he stars his daughter Susan Gordon, who. Um, was a, a real a noted child actor. She was in some pretty big name you know films you know over the course of about ten years or so, uh, and, and a good child actress at that. Uh, she is the one picturing mommy dead, I suppose, uh, in this film. Um, but this film also stars uh, Martha Heyer, one of my favorite uh, actresses from the forties, fifties, and sixties. Uh, beautiful, really talented. Um, she could play innocent or she could be a really cutthroat um femme fatale uh she, she had quite a range and uh the other co-star is Zsa, Zsa gabor not noted for her range but actually works in this movie i mean she's supposed to be um kind of a superficial hateful i'm not saying that she actually was but she um does a good job with the role you know, as being sort of the evil stepmother, I guess I should say. Uh, a lot of fun, very hard movie to find, I will say. Um, the first time I found it, well, when I bought it, when I found it, but but I bought it at Amoeba uh, Records in San Francisco, uh, probably like 15 years ago. I was so excited to see a copy of it. I was like, I, I don't care if I have to throw away my clothes. This is going back <laughs> to my, you know. Uh, and uh, love the movie, and it's one of those that I'd always wanted to see, but I'd never had um, the opportunity to do so. But you'd be surprised at some of the the films that some some big actors and actresses made. Uh, there was a Frogs with Ray Milland, and that's a fun movie. Uh, it's early '70s drive-in fair that I saw at a drive-in probably when I was seven years old. Uh, Joan Van Ark and uh, Ray Milland, uh, and he's this you know, crusty, cantankerous Southerner. Uh, he, he's clearly having a ball with the role. 
uh, he's enjoying himself. And, you know, the antagonists are the frogs, which is kind of fun. Uh, I, I like it when, I like it when nature is the enemy, um, you know, sort of with Hitchcock's birds, um, which is a brilliant film. Um, and uh, one that this, that's my favorite Hitchcock film to tell you the truth. Although I was going to say it was psycho, but, but I've decided that it's actually the birds. Um, Birds I remember and Psycho I remember. Those are all both excellent movies. Are these movies available like uh, on streaming? Are they part of the uh, art film archive? Are they on Prime? Because uh, uh, you and I like to quest and find physical objects, but uh, we're, we're yeah. no longer living in that uh, age and fewer things are, are being released now. And the DVDs have actually gotten more expensive, like uh, like $5 yes. more expensive, $10 uh, more expensive. Yes, they have. Uh, Blu-rays are like $22 now yeah. you know, for something. And I, I still buy them, but uh, I mean, I don't collect the way I used to, but I've seen some great titles that are newly available on Blu-ray and I'm going to scoop them up. One of them is another uh, horror film of the, you know, faded actor, actress genre called Savage Intruder. I, I in, until I was doing research for tonight, I'd never heard of this movie. It's uh, Miriam Hopkins' last film. Uh, it was done in 1970. And Gail Sondergaard, who was a you know great actress from the 30s and 40s, uh, is also in it. Um, and it's a, kind of a wild film. I, I, Miriam Hopkins uh, is actually kind of brilliant in it. And, and it's not an expensive movie, you know, by any means. But she really plays this delusional, um, you know, faded actress, but wealthy. Um, at mm -hmm. the same time, it, it's 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 not Norma Desmond though. I mean, she's not um, not as tragic as Norma Desmond. Uh, I mean, she's not she's clearly not having a good time in this movie. But well, I mean, well, actually, she is having a good time in it here and there. Now that I think about it, um, she's an alcoholic in the movie, but she's completely out about it. You know, she's not trying to hide it. <laughs> it doesn't bother her a bit that she's an alcoholic um it's it's an amazing film and trying to find the moral center of it's impossible it, i'm not sure it has one uh but that's what that's one of the things that really makes it brilliant if it does have one i guess it would be gail sondergaard i guess she's probably the the, the voice of morality in this but even she's kind of shady What's too. the movie about? Without spoiling it, what's the movie about? Well, Miriam Hopkins is a faded alcoholic uh, actress who uh, predictably, happen. yes, pre predictably uh, would like to be famous again, uh, but is probably uh, too much into her cups to to ever pull herself back together. And uh, her servants, you know, her, her team and her home are basically running things. And it's actually shot in Norma Talmadge's uh, home. So it's, it's a very grand Hollywood Hills home. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, very 1920s, you know, super rich uh, uh, Hollywood. Uh, and, and sitting on top of a bluff. I mean, it, it's just a stunning property. And, and a great setting, you know, for the film. Um, so it does, I guess, have some Sunset Boulevard overtones now that I think about it. But she uh, gets involved with uh, a young man that's been hired to you know, work around uh, the house. And he's like 40 years younger than she is. And um, it's just sort of a process of him turning into a monster, essentially. Does the alcoholism contribute to that uh, process? Oh, golly, he's got several problems. So <laughs> there's, there's a lot to it. Um, Miriam Hopkins in it is is more or less the victim, but she's not really sympathetic. And, and she doesn't, and her character doesn't really seem to want sympathy either. There are movies like that and TV shows like that where I can't figure out who I'm supposed to root for or who I'm supposed to identify with, or who I'm supposed to even like. <laughs> well, I mean, you getting up in years, I'm identifying with Miriam uh, in this movie. Okay. I'm a, a kind of, she looks great in the film. She's, um, oh, probably, I would say 67, 68 years old at the time of filming. 
she, she, if she's had any plastic surgery, it was very good because she doesn't look weird or phony or anything in it. She appears to be, you know, in, in very good physical condition. You actually, she actually does a semi-nude scene uh, in it. And I think that's fantastic uh, to, yes. be, yeah. to be that body positive, you know, back then or now for that matter. Um, and you don't really see that among people who are our age or older. And I think we need to take that back. You, uh, you know what I mean? Yes, I know exactly what you mean. I, I, I think so too. Um, and uh, just as a brief aside, uh, if you don't follow Mamie Van Doren on Facebook, you really should. Uh, because you know, for me, she has successfully, and I don't know how you feel about this, but she has successfully sexualized being 90. And I, no, I'm serious. She, and she's an extremely bright woman and it's fun to read you know, her takes uh, her take on you know, a certain you know, political or social issue. They're, they're very well thought out. Um, she's done her research, she's very bright. But at the same time, she's still doing cheesecake. And I think that's fantastic. And she looks fabulous. I mean, you'd never guess she was 90 years old. Sybil Danning, I was uh, blessed enough to have her on the show a, a while mm -hmm. back. Uh, she's also someone who's uh, um, getting on in uh, years, but still looks fantastic and is still very highly uh, sexualized. And she's phenomenally intelligent. When I researched her, when I talked to her, that became uh, very, very clear. You know, she doesn't fit what most people would expect uh, from someone who's made the type of movies that she's made. She's a phenomenal person. Mm -hmm. And so is Mamie Van Doren, as a matter of fact. Um, and I, I, I think that's terrific, though, uh, to be able to, to, to and, and to tell you the truth, that's why they both look good, is because they're not focused on being old. It, something recently was done in the X-Men franchise with Logan. Uh, in the comic books, they have like old man Logan, old man Star uh, Fire Lord, you know, old man, you know, whatever. Uh, but uh, they made the movie Logan, where Logan and Professor X are, sh are much advanced in years and no longer uh, a fraction of as powerful or as uh, uh, brilliant as they were. Uh, Professor X is struggling with a form of dementia. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, again, there's a lot of horror around that that I won't spoil. Uh, but uh, uh, that too, it showed that older people, much older people, uh, can still be the heroes of action movies, even though they're clearly not in you know peak uh, condition as they once were. Yeah, but on the other hand, we've got something that you know the younger set doesn't. We've got time and history on our mm -hmm. on our side. We we we've seen successes and failures over the last. 50 50 or 60 years, we tend to know what works and what doesn't at this age. So that's our superpower right there. Right. It's just, it's just experience. It's just having lived through that much history is uh, a very powerful thing, really. Um, that knowledge is something that you, you just can't study. You, you can't read about it. You, you have to live it. And you know, you've been there once or twice, so you're not going to go there again with very many things that uh, when you're younger, it's like, why not? Or this sounds like a great idea. No, it really isn't a good and, idea. And as you get older, you think, gosh, will my knees survive this activity? Maybe <laughs> not. Maybe, maybe I should stay home. I can um, certainly sympathize. <laughs> You know, there are you know, just so many great horror films. You know, it's kind of hard to talk about them uh, at all. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons is because there's just so many you know, subcategories uh, in horror, so many uh, subgenre. But uh, as you know, I'm a huge public domain fan. And yes. you know, one of my student workers asked me today about that if I knew any good uh, horror films that were public domain because my student workers were doing um, horror night, horror movie night in our uh, commuter lounge. Oh, wow. And, and so I gave him a list. One of them was today's movie of the day, which is Children Shouldn't Play with Dead Things. That's another I great title. That. Yes, another great yeah. title. Yes. It is a great title. And you know what? It's not a bad movie. It, it's uh, Bob Clark, who directed Porky's and A Christmas Story. Uh, in Black Christmas, uh, that's my favorite. That that is such. A, it's a great Christmas horror film. 
Uh, he is the director of Children Shouldn't Play with Dead Things. He's billed as Benjamin uh, Clark, which is his actual name. Um, but uh, it's, it's a really fun movie. The makeup in it, and you can tell it was made on a shoestring budget, but the makeup for the corpses is really creepy. And um, I, can't, I can't really talk about what happens in it, but you can tell that the movie borrows a lot from George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. Uh, by the way, the corpses move. I wouldn't, I, I'm not sure I could necessarily call them zombies, but they're in, it's in the same vein, if you know what uh -huh. I mean. Uh, but uh, it's kind of a chilling film and it, it, it's kind of sleazy. Uh, well, and that, that's great, you know, for a horror film. I, I don't mean to, I'm not demeaning it by saying it's sleazy. Um, but uh, you know, at the very very beginning of the film, uh, they're digging up dead bodies, you know, and, and kind of making fun of it, you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, only for the dead bodies to come to life, <laughs> which is the brilliant part of it. You know, it, it's fun to see uh, revenge exacted so quickly. Uh, for me, it usually takes years. Uh, but, uh, it's such a fun movie so that was one of the films that I recommended to him uh, to watch uh, to her I should say to watch and another one I said I said my hey you know you, we're all going to Pittsburgh tomorrow night you know, almost all of my student workers and I am so I said well watch the seminal Pittsburgh zombie film watch Night of the Living Dead which he which mm -hmm. she hasn't watched by the way she oh, wow. before. I can't believe there's anybody who hasn't seen that. Uh, that that was a classic landmark uh, movie. Well, not only that, but you know, um, the area in which I live bleeds black and gold. I mean, it's Pittsburgh Steelers all the way, and uh, you know, Pittsburgh is the it's the city you know in this area, and these kids you know, love it, but you know, find out a little more about it. <laughs> Because it is where you know the zombie movie, modern zombie movies, I should say, it it gave birth to the modern yes. zombie. Movie. I, and, and if Pittsburgh has no other claim to fame, I think that's a fantastic one to have. And uh, also, you know, D Dawn of the Dead, which is you know, another great film, uh, was shot in Pittsburgh Metro. Uh, it was shot in Monroeville, but that's just a few miles you know, away from Pittsburgh. I also recommended that they might want to watch The Brain That Wouldn't Die, which was our movie of the day uh, just a few uh, days ago. Uh, it stars Virginia Leaf, who was briefly somebody. She was briefly close to being A-list. She was a Fox contract player and was signed in the mid 50s, made two or three very high profile films, and then the studio system collapsed. Mm. Uh, and you know she she did some TV and she did a really low budget horror film in 1959, which oddly wasn't released until 1962. I'm not really sure what the holdup was there, uh, but it's the film we know as the brain that wouldn't die. And uh, oftentimes her character is as mocked as uh, you know, Jan in the pan. Her name is Jan in the movie, and she spins the movie sort of in this lasagna pan uh, and, and, and there's, some, uh, there's some fluid you know, to disguise the fact that it's just her head, you, you know, uh, and she's you know, crouching you know, uh, under a table. Um, but it's a really, it's a really fun, sleazy, creepy film. Uh -huh. uh, the uh, male lead in it, who's, uh, I mean, he's a great actor. His name's Jason Evers. He did a lot of character actor roles. Um, but in this film, he's sort of an evil scientist, but I mean, he has absolutely no morals. Uh, he wants to attach his girlfriend's body uh, or her, his girlfriend's head, and, and that's Virginia Lee. She's the one in the pan. Her head's become severed because he was driving his convertible too fast. They went off the road and her head went flying. He grabs her head and then puts it in his laboratory and keeps her alive, keeps it alive somehow, even without lungs. I, I'm not really sure how all that works. She can speak, um, but he goes out shopping for a body for her and he goes to strip clubs. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's and um, it, it, his 
I mean, he, <laughs> your opinion of him goes down the hill from there. <laughs> he, he does he does horrible things. Oh, you know, all in the name of science. Uh, and in meanwhile, his poor girlfriend is starting. She's becoming demented on her own, but she doesn't want to live anymore. She doesn't want to be ahead in the pan. So she has found one of his experiments in a closet by telepathy. Tele I, was, and, I was wondering. And she is able to control. He's a giant mutant. He's like eight feet tall. Uh, and she is able to control him by a telepathy. And he, the, uh, the actor who portrayed the, you know, um, the, the mutant you know, uh, in the closet well, was a very tall man, but they, they did very, very menacing, very you know, frightening. Uh, and it's, it's a fun movie, like I said. It's kind of down and dirty and a little sleazy, and that makes horror films even that much more yeah. fun, I think, especially when they are low budget. Um, I, I love it when a film revels in being, <laughs> you know, we didn't spend much on this movie, but, but still make it fun. And, um, and, and it, it, she, with telepathy, found this in the closet. What else did he have in the closet or his sock drawer you want? You wonder. Well, the 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 uh, bad doctor, the you know, the evil the evil doctor, um, had he had several um, misfires uh, when it came to his experiments. Uh, one was his lab assistant, who his arm was uh, you know severely damaged in an accident in the laboratory, and the doctor was you know, cl claiming that he was looking for another arm to put on. Um. So it was just it was sort of mishaps like that in the film, and it's a it's a low budget movie, but but so much fun. And the pr even better, the print that you can find uh, on archive.org and um, a YouTube is real. It's beautiful. It's crystal clear. It, there's nothing better than a public domain film with a great print. Uh, Children shouldn't play with dead things has a, has a really nice print as well. No negative scratches or anything, and, and the, the soundtrack is good. You know, you can hear it, hear it really well. Um, I, I mentioned you know, that I was going to talk about another horror film, and in this case, it's uh, Diabolic, um, which is a 1955, 1955 French film, which I got to see as a teenager. I actually owned the entire print on, on Super 8 millimeter sound. Uh, and it was, it was subtitled, and uh, I got it you know, for a pretty good deal back then. And it was one of those films that I'd read about, wanted to see, and it's brilliant. Uh, it is done so well. It's a great psychological thriller. It keeps you guessing at every turn. You never know. You might think you've got it figured out, and then you don't. Um, and the plot just keeps twisting and turning. It's fantastic. I, I, I have much love, you know, for, for that movie. Uh, I really do. It's a great film. And Simone Cinere and Vera Clouseau uh, are the um, are the two main characters. Uh, Vera Clouseau was the uh, wife of the director uh, of the film, and sadly, only lived a few years uh, past uh, you know, the making of the film. She died in 1960, and this. The film uh, came out in 1955, which is kind of sad. And there's sort of a life parallel to her character, how her character meets her demise in the film and how she met her actual demise, which is kind of creepy. Was that in, in that, so that wasn't intentional? Uh... Well, I don't think so, no, <laughs> no. No, her character in the movie has heart problems and uh, Vera Clouseau uh, died from a heart attack. Uh. You know, so it's, it's sad, but 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 eerie at the same time. It almost makes the film a little scarier to know that. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I, I know. I hear you know. Like, Ooh, yeah, that, that's that's kind of weird. Um, and I'm, th there's some classics. I mean, you, you know, you, I, I've you know uh, professed my love of Carnival of Souls a number of times. Yes. Um, I would highly recommend to people to watch a great Mexican horror film called The Brainiac. Uh, it's a fantastic movie. I think it gets overlooked some, but it, it actually is kind of scary. The, the monster is pretty terrifying to look at, and 
uh, he feeds off people's brains. So I, I, I kind of like that uh, plot uh, motivator as well. Uh, it's a fun, it, it's, it's a very fun Mexican horror film. Uh, I can't say enough good things about it. Starving now. And um, uh, another one that I don't think enough people have seen is, is called The Manster. Um, it's a, I remember a, that. Oh, he, he's, you know, the, the uh, protagonist starts to grow a second head. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It's an, Eng, it's, it's an English movie, but it's shot in Japan. So it sort of has an, a, an international uh, cast and it has some very creepy um, you know, passages to it. There, there's some disturbing mental images that pop out of that movie. And it's, it's clearly an, an inexpensive film. You know, of course, but that doesn't. I, I sometimes I think that not having money works to a horror yes, film. Yes, yes. You know, I remember I I only made one film and it was uh, sixty minute. And it was like it was kind of like a reality show and documentary. Um, I, I guess Spinal Tap would, would be something you could compare it to, and that it was there was real reality in it, but then there was a lot of, you know, wouldn't it be cool if there were ninjas in the scene, you know, or aliens? Or, so we added them later on and told a, a story over the course of the season in a, uh, 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 um, a movie. Um, and uh, it, it got to see on TV, it got to a limited run in the theater. So it was, it was very exciting uh, to do that. But a lot of the stuff is like, what can we do on the sly? And a lot of the references we used were old movies that we saw. How did they handle something like this? And then, you know, uh, although we came up with a lot of original stuff, we also did like a little Easter egg adaptations for, as you said before, people who were in the know and uh, they would get it, but nobody else would get it. And you know, it didn't really matter anyway. Yeah, and you, that, that's little Easter eggs like that make a film fun. Yeah. You know, especially if you're if you're even slightly in on the the joke uh looking for them it'll keep it'll keep you going you know it'll keep you hooked in and that is a really smart way to keep an audience you, it must be nerve-wracking you know to be a director uh to be a screenwriter and wanting people to buy in you know to the fantasy that you're creating and you're constantly losing them <laughs> You know, well, you need a hook. You know, you need to keep. You need something there to keep them going. Lloyd Kaufman uh, from Trauma Entertainment. Mm. Yeah, uh, he wrote a book uh, about everything I learned about movies. I learned from Toxic Avenger, and he had a sentence in there that. Uh, and then I was making movies without a camera, and I got to learn what he meant by that because uh, you know the there were basically there was no money in what I was doing. It was all no budget, very low budget, whatever money I could find to put into it. Uh, so a lot of times you had no camera people. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'm not going to give up on the movie. The camera people will show up. You know, they always did. You know? uh, so what can I do? So I, you know, you're working on the movie. And all doing all the things uh, you could do without cameras, you know, keeping everybody who started still interested because you'll need them for later scenes, you know, and, and I mean to reshoot these uh, these scenes because uh, people you started with are no longer available. So, uh, yes, it, it's very frustrating and it eats up like a phenomenal amount of time. You're not going to sleep very much. Um, but, you know, it, looking back on my 60 plus years, it's one of the, the high points of that journey. So, you know, I wouldn't have traded that time for anything. Well, that's fantastic. It's great that you know that you know is still emblazoned upon your memory like that. That's that's great. I'm looking forward yeah, to the movie you make when you retire. Well, you know what? That's actually not a bad idea. I, I have, I have, I have <laughs> well, but I have terrifying visions all the time. It would be pretty easy to commit them to Microsoft Word. <laughs> you know, um, I, I've also got some pretty decent ideas for a uh, comedy series as well. Um, actually, this, the situation that I'm in job wise, uh, I, I think a situation comedy about people who work on a college campus, I think it would go minimum eight seasons. Yes. There's so, there's so much you could do with it, especially in my department, because we handle um, a lot of non-academic issues. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that students that students legitimately run into. I mean, we we probably did as as undergraduates too. Uh, but um, uh, it's just one of those things you'd have to be there for it. But but I but I think it could be a pretty good sitcom. 
I've worked in three colleges. And I've worked with over 80 of them when I when I was designing student intern volunteer programs. So yeah, I can see a lot of uh, co comedy rising from that. Uh, uh, and I have several seasons with the stories, and I'm sure you have uh, many more. It's been years since I worked in education. Well, I've been doing it off and on since 1988, so <laughs> and most mostly on to tell you the truth. Um, but yeah, it's been. Uh, I guess it was my calling. You know, uh, I, I certainly haven't regretted uh, picking higher education for a career. Um, and it's, it's so great to work with young people because yes, it is. You, a lot of older people will deride young people for being stupid, lazy. Uh, no. what, what, are, what are some of the other horrible things that young people are? Um, but there are stupid, lazy people in every generation. You can't, no, really, no you, ages, yes. you can't really point to, you know, and say, oh, you, know, you, 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 you Gen Z or you, you, you're worthless. Well, no, because there are a lot of baby boomers who are kind of worthless too. You know, they've just been, you know, riding everybody else's coattails for the last seventy years. Uh, <laughs> not all of them, of course, uh, but you know, they're in every in every generation. There was somebody who was, as my grandfather would say, no count. Hmm. But there are many people who are counts. So well, and they're the ones who make things happen. They're the reasons we have public works. They are the reasons that we have food on our table. Everybody else is getting the free ride. <laughs> and again, there's enough resources to go around, really, uh, that everybody can get a free ride if we choose if we chose to, we to do that as a society. Uh, yeah. And in uh, several places in the world, that happens more than here, unfortunately. Um, and it, I, it would be actually cheaper for all of us, really. Uh, it but, would be, yes. Yeah, I know, but. And it well, would help the economy too. But that, anyway, that's, that's a fight for cool. another day. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to producing more uh, also. Um, yeah, and uh, this is the next uh, step, getting things on YouTube and getting used to producing uh, videos and learning, editing. And, and eventually, I guess if I put the call out there, I'll get a tribe of people who are looking to work on something. And when I had the TV show, that's pretty much how it ran. Like uh, people who worked on TV or, uh, you know, who wanted something different on the reel. Well, my show was phenomenally different. So they got to, you know, get clips to put on their reel. I gave people credit. So if I had interns, I'd give them real jobs to do rather than get my coffee and make copies and, and things like that. So they got to actually have credits and productions that were aired on, uh, you know, television or, mm -hmm. or so you know, I was always very conscientious about that. So I got I got people um, and and people who didn't have the creativity to produce uh, something original, but they had the technical skills to to help out. So I was able to provide them with uh, experiences. So again, we live in a different world. Anybody with a twenty dollar camera from Walmart now can you know be a producer and and things like that. So the challenges are are different, but I'm sure there are people out there looking for opportunities to work with other creative people. So that's what I've been having in mind uh, more and more. And uh, um, I certainly have enough ideas <laughs> to keep that going, you know, till I'm no longer here. So that's uh, kind of like where I'm headed uh, also. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if you are looking to, to do something like, like that and uh, can't offer money, but can offer um, your know, real world work experience, uh, you know, looking at your local university uh, yes. is a great way to find talent, and that talent won't always be students. You'll probably find some faculty and staff as well. I'd you'd even talk to you. You'd be surprised how many professors are really just failed actors. No, I wouldn't be surprised. Really. I mean, no, 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 they are. They're standing in front of the classroom because nobody wanted them on stage, but... Well, they'll have the opportunity. A lot of people got into acting through my fringe, uh, you know, low-budget uh, TV show. You know, they they started off like a couple of people became models, or you know, well, wound up on uh, other television shows later on. Uh, you know, it was a stepping stone. You know, and uh, they liked what they experienced, so they proceeded uh, with it. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing that again. Um, and, and again, my time is limited now and I'm no longer as uh, spry, I guess would be the word as I was when I was younger. Uh, so I, I can't be the, you know, the action figure 
<laughs> like I was in in past uh, productions. Uh, but I, I definitely could create a role for myself that uh, mirrors what I actually do and uh, tell stories. And so th th that is awesome, you know, uh, and uh, uh, I really am looking for your creativity expressing itself uh, uh, also. So we'll be interviewed on other shows, higher budget shows <laughs> uh, at that time. Or maybe not higher budget, but since the means of production are so inexpensive now, um, that, that's sort of what I'm looking forward to, is just being able to do cheap effects, but make them look good. Like, you know, ha having my drive-in theater logo right here. And I, I, I hate to say this, but I put this together in about 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, backdrop that I've got now. <laughs> I haven't figured out how to do that yet. As you can see, I, I still have the curtain be behind me. Oh, actually, I, I did this in Photoshop, and I just grabbed um, a screenshot of the uh, homepage on my website. Sans, I scrubbed all the text off of it, you know, and, and the the, uh, the tables and everything, uh, so that it was just this background. And I just did a, a screen capture and then um, tailored it to uh, the dimensions that I wanted in Photoshop. It, like I said, it couldn't have taken, I, I couldn't have spent five minutes on the whole process. I probably should have spent a little more, but. I will get there, but I'm not even there yet. So uh, uh, when I get there, I'll have a cool uh, background behind me too. I, I also want to incorporate like costumes in one of the shows. We talked about this for a while. I'm doing a, uh, um, a Star Trek, another sci-fi show starting tomorrow, actually. Mm. Uh, and uh um, these uh, folks have Star Trek uniforms and uh, all I need is a gold toga because Apollo had a gold toga and incidentally they had a show called Star Trek Continues and the guy who played Apollo came back and he was years had passed for him uh, as well and they didn't hide that in the uh, in his uh, appearance so uh, you mean Michael Forrest yes mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to that. And that'll be the first uh, costumed uh, piece. Uh, and then I'm hoping to evolve it uh, from there. And people are sharing ideas. One of our hosts, he's a graphic artist. So he said he's going to design uh, professional looking uh, uh, logos that we can put before each show. And yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to learning how to actually put it before each show. We tried that with uh, some uh, less uh, professional looking images. And we couldn't figure out how to make them stick at the beginning on uh, on um, uh, YouTube. And YouTube used to have the simple tools where you could do that there, but now they don't give you the simple to, uh, tools. So you need to do it somewhere else before you mm -hmm. put it there. Mm -hmm. But fortunately there are some, you know, <clears throat> Adobe's got uh, pr Premiere and that's pretty good uh, software to use. I haven't um, you know, played with it enough to know my way around it. But uh, I am pretty good with Photoshop. I've been using it for the last 30 years or so. Um, and all, all of the graphics uh, on my website, have, I've run through Photoshop. Uh, and they're awesome graphics. Mm -hmm. So I, I will tap into your expertise and I will share with you gladly what I learned from, uh, from YouTube in the uh, weeks ahead. Um, Brian, thank you. It is always a pleasure uh, speaking with you. I look forward to it. And I look forward to our next uh, conversation already. Are there any last words of wisdom you would like to share with people before you share your contact information? I'd like to say happy Halloween. Uh, you know, the season's upon us. There are some great horror films out there. Uh, and, you know, pick a, pick a category that you want to explore more. Uh, you, uh, if you are interested in zombie movies, reach back and see, watch some lower budget zombie movies. You'd be surprised at the things that you can find uh, on, on YouTube uh, with just a little bit of investigation. You can tap into some you know, old films that really are a lot of fun to watch and have some you know, brilliant, very, very complex plots, some great performances too. Thank you very much. I do that every day. <laughs> so it's great advice uh, to follow. Thank you. Happy Halloween to you. And uh, again, thanks for everything. You're, you're a great person and a great friend. Oh, thank you, Hercules. And happy Halloween and happy anniversary. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody who tuned in, whether you, well, who hasn't tuned in yet, but who will soon tune in on uh, YouTube. Uh, 
uh, to everybody, happy Halloween and joyous journeys and amazing adventures. Uh, this is Hercules Invictus and Brian Walker uh, signing out. Good night.